This is great. We are live with one of our most requested guests, Mr. Steve Song. Steve, welcome back, first of all. Uh, thanks very much for having me. And you've got a great signal, if I may say, and that's important in these things. Also, see that we've got, uh, we've got a great crowd here. Derek from Counterpath, Mr. David Duffett from Digium. We're going to be seeing each other at Astrocon. James Bode, wearing his uh, underwater glasses. He'll be at Astrocon. Michael is here, Michael Graves, and um, Andy and Bob Bowles. So that's a pretty full house. Steve, um, we've uh, we've talked many times about what you do, but I think that if someone is watching this for the first time, it probably would be good to introduce Village Telco first of all. Uh, sure, um, Village Telco is an uh, open source, open hardware uh, initiative to develop uh, low cost uh, voice and data infrastructure for areas that uh, where access is either expensive or or unavailable. And uh, it was really, a, you know, it grew out of um, an awareness of the of the potential of uh, of connectivity to to sort of transform uh, lives, both socially and economically. But a realization that uh, that while mobile phones were, you know, were doing amazing things in in terms of transforming access, there were uh, once you went beyond the sort of economics of a standard mobile network, that there were people who were being left off, and so. Um, that's where uh, that's where we got started with Village Telco, and you've got actually uh, lots of deployments that I really didn't know anything about until I went to the site that you sent me to. Which, by the way, coincidentally, we have right here for the Hangout. That's VillageTelco.org. <laughs> How about that big old panel? Oh, let me put that up for a minute there, so we can, people can see it. Uh, and uh, let, you, would you like to talk a little bit about some of the recent deployments? Uh, sure. Um, it, it, interestingly, um, uh, some of the bigger deployments we've had uh, um, become aware of are actually, uh, although we started this initiative in, in South Africa aimed at Sub-Saharan Africa, have actually been in Latin America. So um, in um, uh, Costa Rica, and in um, in Colombia, we have uh, um, some village tel. I say we, but it's actually other people who are deploying the uh, village telco technology. And uh, interestingly, they're deploying it in areas where where there is mobile coverage, but uh, the uh, the coverage you know is, is spotty. So geographically, uh, you know there are part communities that are that are being. Uh, excluded from that that mobile uh, coverage, in particular in um, uh, in uh, Jorge Gomez in in Colombia is, is just outside, 60 kilometers outside the capital of Bogota, in a you know what looks like a you know quite a nice little suburb, but there's just no uh, because of the sort of you know the hilly nature of the, the the terrain around Bogota, there's just no coverage there. So he's built a kind of local uh, you know local phone company for his community there and. Um, uh, and uses sort of you know one mesh potato per house to deliver that service. And we've spoken a little bit about the mesh potato before, but again, something that you should probably introduce to people who are new to this. And plus, they have the pleasure of seeing you live on on YouTube <laughs> if they're live now. Let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Do you do you have any screen shares, by the way? Uh, because if you well, there's a screen share. <laughs> That's what they look like. Um, this is our first generation uh, mashed potato, and it's uh, it's 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 not actually that complicated. It's um, a um, a mashup of um, uh, an 802.11 uh, 802.11 G wireless access point and an analog telephony adapter built in together. Um, what's a little bit different about the um, the uh, wireless access point is that we run it in a, in a mesh mode as opposed to a, a, a simple wireless access point. So, a simple wireless access point, you know, it's a it's a one to many connection, one access point, and everybody connects to the one point. Whereas, in a uh, in a mesh, each device acts as both a receiver and a repeater for the network, uh, and that's why we built it in an outdoor enclosure. Uh, so uh, you know it's designed to be mounted on the outside of houses so that um, the, the devices can see each other and repeat the signal. Uh, you know me uh, mesh networks are not um, 
they're not a panacea in that you can't sort of repeat infinitely, but they are a great way of sort of deploying, you know, a very rapid um, local infrastructure. In fact, you know, we've gone from the, the, the metaphor I used to use to introduce Village Telco was, uh, was you know, we wanted to set up, uh, make setting up a telephone company as easy as setting up a WordPress blog. But, uh, but the, my, the, the, the new metaphor that I use to introduce Village Telco is, is we're trying to bring, uh, you know, build uh, uh, voice and data Lego. Right, so we want you just to be able to, you know, to the more the more devices you plug in, you know, you, the bigger your wall of connectivity gets. Let me see if we can get Carl Fife to ask his questions. You probably saw him go by on um, IRC. By the way, IRC channel is VUC on Freenode.net. You can also see us on VUC.me and so on and so forth. Carl, are you uh, unmuted and ready to go? I, I am. I, I'm not. I can't vouch for whether or not Comcast is going to deliver my packets in a timely fashion. So sound good. Sounding like uh, yeah. Okay. Good. So um, I'm just curious about. Uh, uh, I, I was curious about the domain, <laughs> domain mode. So I think I think which uh, in 802.11g there's a the IEEE specifies. I think they call it ad hoc mode. Is that how you're doing your? Is that the mode you're doing, or are you really hacking down onto the onto the uh, you know the link layer and creating your own kind of Protocol, as it were. Um, well, uh, it is uh, it is ad hoc connectivity, so the um, uh, that is correct. But uh, but the um, the actual mesh protocol runs at layer two, so um, it it makes the um, wireless network look to the average user like just a one big switch, which actually makes um, the setup of um, a mesh potato network uh, trivially easy um, because um, as long as you plug one of the devices into um, something that's offering layer three services like DHCP and that sort of thing, then anything else that connects to the mesh potatoes, whether through the ethernet port or through the wireless interface, behaves as if it were plugged directly into that upstream connectivity. So there's no, you know, um, um, uh, you know, setting up internet routing when you have sort of multiple uh, layers of connectivity can can be a nightmare. And uh, the the layer two sure. mesh is one way of dealing with that in a in a very um, uh, transparent sort of way. And so and so is it is it all essentially one large Ethernet broadcast domain, or are you managing? Are you are you compartmentalizing that some way so you don't end up with too much chatter, especially in a carrier sense multiple access transport? Uh, yeah, you've put your finger on the issue with uh, with layer two to mesh, and that that uh, you know obviously uh, uh, layer two wasn't really designed with a, a wireless network in mind. It was designed with right. you know a physical infrastructure. Um, the the protocol we're using is called Batman Advanced, and um, and w what they've managed to do in the in the in the development of this protocol is introduce a kind of isolation. Um, Protocol into that mesh so that that a lot of the kind of uh, you know the, if the, stuff like you know the kind of net bias calls you get from a badly win configured Windows machine that kind of thing are all inhibited at the point of origin. So uh, to to answer your question, um, you know uh, the the ne the network stays fairly clean except for the the traffic that's intended on it. I see. Yeah. Any other questions while we've uh, paused yeah. here? Yeah, Steve, I've got a question for you. Uh, can you just run through the the requirements at the back end um, on what you do at the back end of your mesh potato cloud to then interface that into the outside world? Well, to be honest, this is something I'm you know I'm uh, I'm hoping to you know engage the. Um, uh, the VoIP user community uh, more on this issue because our expertise really uh, is about sort of 80% wireless and 20% uh, VoIP. Uh, you know, we um, uh, we've worked very hard at developing the device and making VoIP work over the wireless mesh, um, but uh, we haven't really settled on. One solution for the for the back end, and you know, uh, we have we have developed uh, some customized solutions for, for people. So a kind of simplified billing solution that people can uh, um, uh, 
uh, get going quickly with in terms of uh, doing pay-as-you-go billing, but uh, but none of them have really taken off, and we're sort of you know on the cusp of now you know do we continue to sort of focus on on kind of local billing solutions or you know look at um, you know companies like 2600 Hertz and others that uh, that offer sort of cloud-based services and you know in a um, in the industrialized world the answer is pretty straightforward I think there's there seems to be a, like a you know a pretty clear uh, case for the cloud but um, you know because we specialize in delivering uh, you know voice and data services in under service areas with sort of uncertain international connectivity that's not always going to be an option so um, you know we uh, we encourage the people who deploy uh, village telcos to, you know, to critically think about their own situations and uh, and help them choose the solution that suits them. So we haven't really, I mean, uh, you know, ultimately our goal is to be able to offer a, a robust, uh, you know, robust solution at both ends, both at this kind of, you know, at the at the CPE device and also as a kind of, you know, packageable service. But but right now um, we're still sort of looking around, and we've been, you know, talking to a number of companies as well, of course. Okay, so there's a whole load of stuff that, uh, or perhaps the the asterisk community can get stuck in and do some bits and pieces. And uh, oh, we would uh, love uh, your help. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Thank you for that. There are thousands and thousands of us out here waiting to help too. <laughs> uh, okay, IRC. Uh, nothing that hasn't been said already. Uh, Andy, Andy, you actually asked a question. Did you get an answer to that? No, 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 no. We haven't Go uh, got as far as uh, asking that question. Yeah, going back to the uh, the level two connectivity, sorry, layer two connectivity. Is is there a practical limit um, in in terms of the number of nodes that you've you've hit at all? Uh, there there are practical limits, and um, uh, most of which we haven't hit. We're aware of what they are. Uh, from a technical point of view, but most of our networks are sort of under 250 nodes, which doesn't seem to directly run into those issues yet. So, um, you know, you um, the number of hops you can make on a mesh is limited. So, uh, you know, um, you you lose roughly 40 per 40 to 50 percent of your bandwidth with each hop you make on the mesh. So you know if you know you rapidly get down to the point where you're only delivering one or two megabytes, which which is fine, but you don't want to go too much further than that. So the answer to that on on, on that level, the the answer to that is is really to not think of a mesh as something flat, um, but rather to sort of um, combine mesh technologies with you know traditional kind of hub and spoke. Uh, Wi-Fi technologies. So rather to think of, uh, you know, the, the mesh as a kind of combination of wireless arteries and arterials, or cap you know, capillaries, so that you know the mesh potatoes are at the are at the far end of the the, the mesh network where they're, you know, they're you know they're they're serving individual users, but they've got to connect fairly quickly to some sort of wireless backbone. We tend to use point-to-point. -point Wi-Fi equipment that creates the you know we call them super nodes that create the kind of scaffolding or wireless infrastructure that you can hang a mesh on. So uh, from that point of view, um, the you know the mesh does scale, but it doesn't scale just as a mesh. It scales as a combination of hub and spoke wireless with uh, mesh technologies, uh, which make you know which make the scaling fairly easy. Um, there are other issues, such as the you know the amount of VoIP traffic that can be carried on a uh, on a single mesh potato, and um, they there is a maximum of somewhere between 15 and 20 simultaneous calls that can be carried on on one mesh potato, and uh, we haven't run into that maximum yet in in most of our networks. Happily, uh, that number will go up significantly with the next generation of our. Uh, of the the mesh potato, which will be based on a on a faster processor with more RAM, and happily it will be a lot cheaper too. That sounds sounds good. And um, how how big have you actually managed to go? I mean, we, if you're talking about a, a, a sort of like a noted star network, um, how far have you, have you have you managed to go? So we don't really have any any networks that are much larger than 200 nodes. Okay. So what sort so, of uh, you know, physical distance are you talking there? 
uh, in that case, you're talking about areas that, uh, you know, that are covering a few kilometers. Very impressive. Thank you. Yes. Steve, you, you touched on the, uh, the hardware there. And uh, I, I think those of us who've looked at this have seen the current generation of hardware. How much, how, how many, it's, how many uh, units of the current generation are still in, the, in stock? And when are we going to see the next generation? Uh, great question. Uh, so uh, we've sold uh, a couple of thousand uh, mesh potatoes, which uh, is, uh, you know, quite frankly, not nearly as many as I'd hoped to have sold by now, but is uh, is is enough to uh, to give us encouragement uh, that uh, that we're on the right track and that developing a second generation will uh, will help us scale up those numbers fairly dramatically. So the um, what I'm uh, holding up in front of me. <laughs> Uh, at the moment is uh, a TP-Link WR703N, <laughs> uh, and that's a, that's a a tiny. I've got one of those here. Yeah, I've, yeah, got, a, I've got a dozen right enough. here next to me. So the the the, the chip, the wireless chip in uh, in this is uh, is made by Atheros, and it's um, it's uh, an AR9331 uh, chip, which is quite astounding in uh, in its capabilities, in that it's. Uh, it's 802.11n. It has built-in support for USB. It has built-in uh, support for up to five Ethernet ports, uh, and it has uh, uh, an interface that can talk directly to an FXS chip. So, uh, you know, the development uh, path for uh, the Mesh Potato 2.0 is a great deal simpler than it was for the original gen original generation, where we basically had to commandeer the serial port on the chip to uh, to make the to create the FXS design, and that was that was David uh, David Rowe's very creative work. Um, you know, with this um, uh, with this little device, um, integrating um, the FXS technology is both cheaper and uh, and easier, and uh, and will will give us a lot more features uh, in the new design. And happily, if you happen to have bought one of these seven hundred three Ns. Uh, you'll know that you can buy them for you know a little over twenty dollars, twenty three dollars. Yeah, mine, so, was tw mine was twenty five dollars, uh, including shipping from China, and it arrived wow. in three days. I was amazed. Yeah, so that that tells us that that the bill of materials uh, for that particular device is probably around ten dollars. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, we are optimistic that, uh, that, you know, we can build a significantly cheaper version of the mesh potato now and, uh, and provide, you know, uh, the kind of, kind of functionality that's so affordable that, that people will, you know, are, are, are much more likely to make the commitment. You know, the thing with, um, the thing with Village Telco is that this is our key infrastructure cost. It's not base stations. It's not towers. It's these little devices. So every, uh, you know, every dollar we shave off the bill of materials of uh, of the mesh potato dramatically reduces the cost of deployment for uh, for someone you know planning a, a network of uh, of any sort of size. Yeah. So currently the the mesh potato retails for ninety nine dollars a piece, and uh, we're we're pretty sure that uh, that the new version is going to retail for for less than half of that. Yeah, and an another point about that particular device is uh, it requires even less power than the mashed potato to to power it, doesn't it? Yeah, it's about one watt. So uh, it'll be a little more with the FXS port, but yeah, it, it, the power consumption should roughly have, which uh, is good news for you know for uh, uh, driving these with uh, with solar power. Yeah, you can get away with a sm with a tiny little solar uh, panel with a with a um, with a little battery. In fact, I've got a, a, a pile of them here. The uh, it's a battery recharger thing with an integrated um, solar panel, uh, which is easy enough to power one of those, even here in UK. <laughs> Um, and the, I mean, the, one of the things that really excites me about uh, about the new generation is the the built-in USB port. So, I mean, that offers lots of interesting possibilities. Uh, so, such as plugging in a 3G dongle if you wanted to create a kind of bridge between Wi-Fi and backhaul, or 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 a sort of redundant backhaul across a, a few different um, 3G dongles. Um, 
you could plug in a memory stick and, ser and, and host a local web server to, to, to cache and serve local content on the network. You could plug in speakers. And uh, and actually use that that network to you know turn it you know turn the the, the the wireless mesh network into a radio station. So I mean I, we're very keen to see the kind of creativity. Yeah, village PA system. <laughs> oh, have we? Um, yeah, Steve, uh, you still with us audio wise? We I think we're. Steve is still quiet. For, ah, we lost you for a second video wise. Is there anything that? Hmm. You know, one of the interesting things uh, about this project is that it had uh, first world uh, potential in disaster recovery, and I, I'm wondering if, if anybody's uh, ever uh, actually tried that, or or if any, uh, you know, maybe North American or say Western organizations have have uh, tinkered with it in that regard. I think Steve is frozen. Okay, well, while we're waiting for Steve to come back, it might be a great time to take a break and talk to Derek from uh, Counterpath uh, about... Uh, by the way, Derek, I keep thinking of that old TV series. You probably know... How many people are old enough to remember Derek Jacoby from... Uh, In Life. Was, was that it? I don't know. Derek Jacoby. My name is Derek Jacoby. Anyway, Derek Jacobs is here from Counterpath. Derek, why don't you... Uh, Clue us in a little bit on the on the beta because we're um, looks like Steve is still frozen here, so we could probably take a break and talk about that real quick. Yeah, sure. Um, basically, what Counterpath is looking for is a, a small active group of beta testers to help us in testing the coming release of Bria three. Um, there are a lot of changes we're doing under the hood and we would like it tested by experienced people on an active basis where we're going to have engineer participation, my active participation. So it's short-lived, a beta test kind of like we used to have in the old days, maybe 10 years ago. What's the best um, way for them to get in touch? We'll put uh, text up right now. Sure. Uh, the best way to uh, apply for this would be to send an email to support at counterpath.com with Bria beta program as the subject, and I will uh, take care of those myself. Uh, we'll likely set up a private forum for uh, back and forth. We'll try and do a, uh, a weekly uh, call between us and stuff like that. Uh, again, more active than the betas have been in the past where we would just look for comments and not actively comment back. And yeah, we're, we're looking for an actual discussion here. Whoops, I don't need all that. Looking for an actual um, back and forth on this. You, you need real feedback and occasionally some of these things come out and a lot of people sign up for them thinking they're just going to get a free product, which I, they do, I guess. But um, really, I have complained several times about people doing that and not actually uh, doing anything, not actually giving any feedback, especially if they have problems and issues. Because if you've got an issue, you need to discuss it and uh, troubleshoot it with the counterpath folks. Yeah, so, and I think we'll, we'll yeah. facilitate that by uh, you know, having a, a roundtable discussion on a regular basis where people can express verbally rather than just being able to post to a forum. I hope that will uh, encourage people to be more active. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I think that generally people are pretty good, but occasionally, uh, you know, we all move around a lot, and I'm, I'm guilty too of this. Um, but if I find an issue, the one thing that I find bad is if you find an issue with a product, whether you've paid for it or you're in a beta or you're just testing it in a trial, um, you've got to give feedback. That's it's so good that the internet has provided that. If, if those of you who are you know old enough to remember what the what it was like before the internet when you got programs on diskettes or whatever, however you got them, and there was you know there was absolutely no way to give feedback. Really, what are you going to do? Write a letter, maybe an email. Nowadays, uh, it's made very simple, and it's really. I want to shame everybody who has not given feedback, whether it's free trial, beta, or whatever, for whatever reason. On the other hand, I want to shame companies that send me surveys and say, it'll only take 15 minutes of your time, and at the end, we'll give you $5 off of this $100 product. Forget that. It's not going to happen, okay? However, Counterpath has the right solution 
they work with you. Polycom's good too, by the way, right, Michael? Give me a nod on that. Uh, yeah, sure. You know, yeah. these these companies, we've worked with a lot of companies, and when we do betas with them, they expect the back and forth, but they do give you value for that, and you feel like you've been a part of it. The VUC is great for that. Okay, we're waiting for Steve to come back. Let me make sure that we have a room. We have room for Steve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So theoretically, there is a slot for Steve. Uh, better go check my email, huh, guys, and see if he's had a problem. And sure enough, there is an email, but it's from Kiva, so that's not him. Let me re-invite him. Maybe he needs a re-invite. Just like SIP, right? <laughs> but then will the re-invite be handled correctly? I'm telling you, it's going to be a NAT issue probably. <laughs> All right. Let's see if we can get him in here. We do need to watch out, make sure that we're not occupying four, four, eight is nine. Yeah. So theoretically, there is a, one slot available for Steve. Um, I'm kind of expecting Tim to chime in as well because Tim has worked with you. Here he is. He's coming back any second now. Does anybody remember the context of where we were? Absolutely. Okay, okay Steve, you're back, and Michael's going to remind me of what we, what we were talking about when you left. Michael, what was uh, the context? I, well, I had just posed a, a question, and the question is, uh, has anybody uh, explored the applications of the mesh potato in disaster recovery kind of right. circumstances? Because this, this was one of the first world applications that I think is very interesting. Um, yeah, and in fact, um, we did talk to um, a number of organizations involved in disaster relief. There are a number of other uh, wireless mesh uh, projects out there that are focused specifically on uh, uh, on disaster relief. Uh, the um, New America Foundation in the in the U.S. funds uh, the Commotion Wireless Project, um, which uh, has their their sort of internet in a suitcase. Um, uh, which integrate wireless mesh technologies, um, which we're we're very open to. Um, but um, it, you know, we've chosen to you know, to focus on sort of small entrepreneurs and build technology that is you know is geared towards helping small entrepreneurs build their own uh, voice and data networks. And uh, we're you know, the. the you know, the technology is is completely open, and we we'd love to see um, groups more focused on disaster relief, you know, uh, running the technology and deploying it. It just hasn't been the core strategic focus for us. And I'm so tiny, but um, uh, you know, it, we we have limited resources to uh, to deploy. Steve, I don't know if you're hearing me okay, but your upstream, your transmission is was extremely disrupted by Pakist loss. So I don't um, know what's happening there north of the border. Go ahead. Uh, I, I think I can fix that. Hold on. It sounds a little better already, and perhaps you were uploading something. Yes, just turn off that P2P transfer. <laughs> <laughs> we no always talk about for you. <laughs> we always joke about these things, but it's true that occasionally uh, we're sharing a bandwidth and somebody's doing something in the other room that we don't know about. It sounds like you're good now, Steve. Okay, yeah, no, that's, uh, I think that's better. Okay. So was the answer uh, comprehensible, Michael, or do we need to sure. go to that? Yeah, no, no, I, I got it. I still have a little, I have an idea for a project that I haven't been able to act on because it's, not my property. I need to uh, entice somebody to move forward on it. But uh, um, there are a, a collection of cottages around a little lake in northern Ontario that I think would make a great uh, little Wi-Fi wi mesh network where they have no 3G, they have no nothing out there, which is maybe part of the appeal, but um, at the same time, to be able to call down to the other cottage and invite someone for dinner would be so handy. Okay. So. All right. So, any other any other questions for Steve before he continues with uh, whatever he's got on his mind? Anyone else? Let me uh, run over to IRC, and I don't want to tell you about how many screens I've got running here. No, I have nothing on IRC. So, uh, anyone want to break in? Somebody's got some flashing lights. Who is that flashing over there? That's Andy. That's Andy. What do you? Oh, it's Morse code. He's being kidnapped. I guess I don't know. It's S O S. Did it? Did it? 
did it out, it did out. Okay, Steve, you were going to start something new, I think. Yeah, I think um, uh, just uh, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the the level of Wi-Fi use uh, and in um, uh, in North America and and some sort of recent statistics that uh, that I've come across. Uh, which indicate that you know just an astounding amount of smartphone traffic is actually going over Wi-Fi. So it, it you know the um, it's a company called Mobidia that uh, have done their research by by actually installing apps on on people's phones to measure how they use the phones. So mm. one of the challenges if you're a mobile operator is that when people go off the mobile network and use Wi-Fi, that's dark to them. They have no data. So it really takes a, a third-party company to actually assess how um, uh, how smartphones are being used, and seventy percent of all the smartphone data traffic is actually traveling on average over Wi-Fi. Those numbers are higher in places like Spain and Germany, but uh, it's it, it's huge. I mean, the, you know, Wi-Fi is like a this massive sort of un, it's like dark matter in the universe. You know, it's uh, this <laughs> massive sort of uh, strategic. Uh, part of of being connected in the industrialized world, uh, which gets no attention, right? It, it you know it, because um, you know mobile operators are keen for people to use mobile networks, you know, and to uh, you know to uh, you know resolve their you know the returns on their investment in LTE networks. So, I mean, and that's not such a big deal in North America because you know it, you know the, the the market is solving that problem, but um, you know in in Africa. If, you know the dialogue is simply not there, and the market development is is simply not there, and all you have really are are this this sort of narrative about uh, about how mobile networks are it and are and, are and and they are you know they are huge, but but there's so much more that could be done by looking at a plurality of access technologies. Interesting, Steve, because uh, I am with a very disruptive um, uh, mobile network here in France called Free.fr, Free Mobile. And free Mobile is an extremely inexpensive. I won't go into the long story of the plan. It's very, very inexpensive, and they have a very, very cheap plan for people who are unemployed looking for work and so on. But uh, long story short, they have a system, and I know James will know the name of this, and perhaps you will. I don't know it. But when you're on the internet, when you're doing 3G, if it finds one of its, because they're on ISP too, if it finds one of its access points, it will switch you over so-called transparently. Uh, I know there's a name for this technology, and it's built into the SIM card, apparently. Yeah, it's uh, called UMA or GAN. There you go. GAN, GAN is the, uh, How, the more up-to-date version. However, uh, in, the, in practice, the handoff is not only not transparent, but sometimes I have to turn Wi-Fi off because it it it, it, it seems when it switches and your if you have an app on and it switches, of course the app gets confused. This may be related to the fact that I'm using an iPhone. I don't know. Maybe it's specific to the iOS. But um, it is it disrupts the disruption, if you will. Uh, but we're talking about 3G and data access, which switches transparently to, to Wi-Fi, which I think is brilliant. By the way, cool, fine, more power to them. However, so not using their towers, which sometimes they are paying for to another operator, such as Orange. But um, as far as voice goes, how does that work? Because I'm not, uh, I'm not quite following that. So you're switching. You're saying that the voice traffic is going over Wi-Fi, and if so, how how do you mean? Um, or were sorry, you talking about data? Or were you talking about data or voice? Yeah, no. The stat, the stats I was uh, um, referring to were were just data traffic. Oh, okay. So, okay. so da data traffic alone. So, yeah, the um, the the issue of uh, of seamlessly switching between uh, Wi-Fi and uh, and three uh, and uh, and mobile networks is uh, well, it, it's there, but there are still a few bugs in the system. Yeah. I think in that uh, you know the the handoff isn't as seamless as it as it should be. Quite frankly. Um, yep. Test testament to this very fact, if you look at this Galaxy Nexus right now, it's sitting in my office, it defaults to being on Wi-Fi. It's got probably a hundred access points entered in its memory, and it's on Wi-Fi wherever it can be, despite the fact that I'm paying the carrier a healthy monthly fee for uh, you know, 3.5G 3, 3 access or HSPA+. Plus. Um, so it's absolutely true. My own experience exactly mimics the stats you're quoting, that the Wi-Fi where possible, please, 
Yeah. And, you know, and it, in, indeed, we talk about mobile technologies and we include tablets as, you know, and when we talk about mobile technologies, but in fact, the majority of tablets aren't mobile devices, they're Wi-Fi devices. And even where people have, um, you know, mobile technology integrated into their tablets, overwhelmingly the preferred, you know, route of access is, uh, is, is via Wi-Fi. I think the, I mean, the, the story of free is one of the most amazing stories of, um, of a, you know, telco slash internet service provider development. They are, you know, a, you know, if, if you could, if you could replicate free around the world, I think you could, you could revolution, revolutionize access. One of the interesting things they did was, was to decide to manufacture their own device. Um, that um, that that delivered all those services and and I think that well it's a it's a complicated story how they you know um, you know how they how they achieved how they completely disrupted the French telecommunications market but um, but there's lots of interesting things to be learned there. Wait a minute, which which device are you talking about, Steve? That they made. They um, so they manufacture a triple play device. Yes, right. Uh, right. But that has nothing to do with the mobile access. But yeah, I mean, what the first thing they did was disrupt the ISP business, and the reason they can do that in this country is because the original, all of the original, um, um, I want to say infrastructure, fiber, DSL, all of that stuff was, of course, nationalized. It was part of the post office, what well, used to be the post office system, um, and then. Uh, a law came out saying that they had to lease it at cost, I think, or at a reasonable price. Uh, so a lot of a lot of uh, operators came out, but the point is where free got crazy was when they did mobile, and the mobile that they offered, they they it took three years for them to get through the red tape to be able to offer it. And while they're building their towers, I mean, there's two sides to the story. While they're building their towers, Orange is forced to sell them time on their towers, I assume at cost or at a very low profit margin. So, I mean, there, it's not without pain. However, to the consumer, such as myself, we are getting unlimited data, unlimited calls to 110-plus countries on the cell phone and on our landline, well, landline SIP, um, for the same low monthly rate. And, I mean, I could go on and on and do a commercial for free because it's brilliant. And you're right. I mean, it would be great. Uh, this is a first world story, of course, because this can only happen where there's already three operators. So that's a whole other, a whole other problem. It's kind of opposite to what, to what you folks are doing. Well, there, I mean, there are some things, uh, things that um, uh, can be learned from that that could be applied anywhere. I mean, one of the big things was just their simple one price option, right? Yes. And uh, you know, in um, certainly in South Africa, where I've you know lived for the last five years. The uh, you know you cannot understand which pricing package is is best for you. It's impossible. I mean, you, you'd have to you know be some sort of mathematical genius to sort of you know work out statistically you know when you're on net, when you're off net, when it's off peak, on peak, um, and you know the, that that is deliberately used by the operators to, to you know to sort of up, obfuscate you know what uh, what you're paying. So that kind of simple pricing strategy, I think, was also hugely appealing. I agree. Uh, that was that was one of his. Um, excuse me, Michael. Just just to touch, just to react to that. Uh, the uh, the guy uh, Xavier Niel, who is apparently a millionaire billionaire from Switzerland, uh, did a jobs like presentation. It wasn't quite as polished or as good, but he did that. And one of the things he mentioned, and it's very very true, and 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 struck a chord, which is that if you go to Orange or SFR or the other uh, Buig, who are the three main operators, the three real carriers in this country, and they, you know, there's 24, as he said in his presentation, there's 24 pages of offers. He has two. They have a free. Gives you two prices. Period. Either everything is unlimited. I mean, unlimited uh, up until whatever it is, three gigs or whatever. Uh, but you have unlimited minutes and so on, and that's one price. That's price X. And then there's a price of an entry-level price for people who absolutely have no money, which is two euros a month. That's like three dollars a month, okay? And these are things that probably would play in Africa if there was already the infrastructure, uh, because that's something that has an echo. This is just terrific for people who are looking for work. They have 60 minutes and 60 SMS. And personally, I mean, 
I can live easily on 60 minutes because I don't talk that much. But then here in Europe, we can receive infinite calls, but only make, you know, expensive calls. But anyway, it was a little yeah. easier here. Now, I'm, I'm dying to, to leap in and show you this device. <laughs> uh, this yeah. is a new toy from uh, Nokia. Um, it's the Nokia Asha 311. It's the top of the range uh, Asha phone for the developing world. And what's really quite amazing about this is that it's got a, an incredibly well featured um, SIP client built into it uh, with, uh, with Wi Fi. It's also got Pentaband 3G in it, which for the price, and this is something that retails for about 75 euros. Uh, it's an incredibly well specified device um, and what what I find interesting is that Wi-Fi originally came in with not with the Nokia enterprise level handsets and then was stripped out because the operators thought it was a really bad thing and now it's gone back into the handsets for the developing world how interesting is that well, anyway. let's, uh Let's hope it saves uh, Nokia, who are you know they're looking for a win. I think they're going to sell millions and millions of these because it's a brilliant, brilliant little phone. Uh, it does so much. Um, is, that, is, is that known as the C2? No, no, this is a no, new one. This oh, is okay. the, the Asha 311, and then there's uh, an Asha 303 as well, which um, is slightly less expensive. This is the, the top of the range Asha with, the, with its with a capacitive touch screen. And Andy it, has it, typed it. It is funny. It, is, it, is it a Windows phone or is it some other OS? No, it's it's actually underneath the graphical front end, it's Symbian Series 40, believe it or not. <laughs> this is the thing, is they, they seem so much to have to have hung their future on, on Microsoft and, and I hope that works out for them, but I you know, <laughs> don't necessarily have a lot of confidence. Well, I, I think they're making more money out of selling to the developing world than they are trying to sell Windows phones at the moment. True. Yeah, I'm sorry, they're... Michael, I had cut you off before, though. Uh, what, what were you going to, about to say? Oh. Forgot? Well, I think that the one price uh, observation that Steve yeah. made was, was very telling because, um, you know, it, not to speak kindly of a company I don't like, but AT&T really, when they <laughs> got into mobile, revolutionized mobile in the U.S. with their national one-rate plan that said, okay, it's it's one price and it's all domestic long distance and, and they you know they bought another company, jumped into mobile and and uh, here we are a decade later, a little, a little longer than that. So yeah, simplified pricing works. Well, it's a lot easier to determine what's going on. Steve, you just uh, kind of uh, parachuted into Canada. You must be uh, dealing with the joys of the mobile system over there. What do you, any comments on that? It is shocking. <laughs> shocking. I mean, it makes me makes me fond for mobile operators in Africa. So you know, Canada has an appalling market. It's essentially you know a duopoly, and if you want GSM, it's a monopoly. And uh, so uh, you know, one of the things, uh, the interesting uh, revelations was was this, was the excess charges. Uh, you know, you can be in the, the remotest part of the Bundu in Africa, and you could still, when someone makes a call, you can still see the number that's calling. Well, that's not a default feature in Canada. If you actually want to see the number that's calling you, that costs you an extra $9 a month. And, you know, I mean, uh, that's purely indicative of the, of the sort of level of competitive pressure that, um, uh, that, that, that exists in Canada, which is not a lot. They did that several years ago here, where every little service was uh, was an extra charge, so yeah, a including call um, caller ID and so on. But that that was when the services were new. Nowadays, uh, it's you know it's all in one. And by the way, uh, it, I don't know if you've been keeping abreast of the situation here, but s as soon as Free came out with that offer, which was less than half of everybody else's price, all three of the main uh, carriers came out with new brands that were offering cheaper offers. So, uh, we better see if we can I, I'm, uh, mute I, David here. There are some particular things about the Canadian um, cellular plans that kind of are especially irksome, having having lived there most of my life. Uh, they they have, as far as I know, the only uh, three-year contracts in the world 
where if you want if you want a subsidized <laughs> iPhone, you're locked in for three years. Three years yeah. is an eternity in mobile network space. Yeah. Don't subsi don't buy subsidized phones. My advice is either, if you can't afford the phone, don't buy it because you're gonna yeah. be sorry. Yeah. I agree. Oh, the, and, and, uh, uh, I, yeah. Ironically, uh, I uh, you know I I had three G three G services wherever I, I seem to be in in South Africa, but uh, uh, but I live about sixty or a hundred kilometers outside of you know a major center Halifax here, and uh, and the best service I can get is Edge, which uh, it's um, it was also a surprise. Yeah, and and there've been a, uh, some peculiar things like um, you know one of the leading players in the market switching from. Uh, is it uh, CDMA to uh, GSM technologies? Is where my brother lives near Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Um, he had to have all of his all of his phones for his company changed out as they switched from uh, 2G CDMA to uh, to 3G uh, GSM. Was it? Um, yeah, Bell. The Bell, Bell Networks eventually abandoned CDMA. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, they they can get 3G there now, but um, I, I think it's funny to track this space and realize that in in places like in India, they're just now going through or trying to go through 3G auctions yeah. for Spectrum, where you know, clearly they're quite a bit further back in the development path of of mobile networks. And well, they're mobile already... ne <laughs> go ahead. Although mobile, like certainly 2.5G mobile networks in India are the ch about the cheapest in the world. It's amazing, you know, that, that uh, we, we, we struggle to, to have a market in, in India simply because, you know, uh, mobile internet is so cheap in, uh, in India. Although the, you know, the pundits say that nobody, nobody's actually making a profit in, uh, in India at the moment. Mm. Mm. I think it's funny that we've already had sort of winners and losers in 4G space uh, in North America, and you know, Clear uh, has had its ups and downs, and uh, we can't necessarily really agree on what 4G is, except from from a marketing perspective. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, there's a packet-deprived Carl out there. Oh, is that Carl? You recognize Carl? That's already more than I was able to do. <laughs> No, Carl, you are crap. <laughs> <laughs> you are low latency, but yeah. packet deprived. <laughs> so, Steve, uh, do you have any any sense of um, for for Mesh Potato two point When? What's the time scale? Uh, so uh, we're um, we're debugging the prototype boards uh, right now, and uh, we hope to have uh, the sort of first production run by uh, March of uh, of 2013. So we're I mean we're uh, we're not going quite as fast as as I would hope, but we're completely bootstrapping our way to to the next generation, which uh, which is good from a point of view of you know. Uh, control and uh, fiscal prudence, but uh, but you know is is necessarily not always as quick as uh, um, as we'd hope. Excellent, excellent. Well, a, 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 the lower cost, higher performance is a good formula for a uh, future. So I'm I'm hopeful. Well, and uh, you know it's 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 really the the, the market that has done that. The price of uh, of Wi-Fi chipsets has you know continues to go down as the performance goes up. It's uh, it's quite astounding. Does that also mean then that you get to take advantage of of uh, different or f you know, further evolved facilities within Wi-Fi? Things like fast uh, fast handoff or uh, or N-type radios or MIMO or this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, there are some parts of the 802.11 uh, um, standard which uh, will be particularly useful to us, uh, such as um, kernel level packet aggregation. So, uh, you know, VoIP packets are typically much smaller than internet packets and, you know, over a, wi a wireless network you want to optimize 
you know, e you want to make sure that each internet packet is, is, is packed as full as possible. And uh, 802.11n introduces some of those efficiencies at the, um, you know, at the, at the core uh, of the technology as opposed to sort of adding it on a layer up. Mm, excellent. All right, we're coming up on the hour here. Any other questions for Steve Song, Village Telco, which I should remind you, uh, let's see if I can do this really cleverly here, Vi villagetelco.org, I believe it is. Let me, uh, everybody's laughing. I have, to, I have to actually grab the screen now, villagetelco.org. But um, we've, uh, we've talked a lot about this because it's, it's a fascinating technology. And I think that in all of our hearts as uh, semi-geeks or full geeks, uh, the idea is to take over, take over your destiny, and uh, I think that uh, what Village Telco is doing is is just that. There's something about it that is just innately right, in my opinion. Does that ring true to you, Steve, or not? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we it, we've seen how the internet has grown in ways that you know is completely bottom up driven. If you can build a bridge to the internet, you can be part of it. Right. And why shouldn't why shouldn't telephone networks work the same way? I mean, it's just there's no reason not to. And we've always, uh, everybody who uh, has been following VoIP, I mean, that's the idea of VoIP, too, is, hell no, I'm not going to pay 20 cents a minute to call the U.S. from, from Europe. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm old enough, I, I know you can see this from looking at me with the gray hair and all that, I'm old enough to tell you that, I mean, there was a time when it would cost, like, and remember, this is when money was worth something. It used to cost like a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, maybe even ten dollars a minute to call the U.S. from some countries overseas and vice versa, of course. And now um, it was at Astrocon probably 2007, something like that, that someone showed a slide in their presentation that was basically showing you that the, the minute of VoIP, the minute of voice on you know, so-called landline, it was going to reach zero. And you know what? It has reached zero. I mean, right now in, uh, in first world countries, Who's going to pay for a minute of VoIP? I mean, no one does, do they? Again, uh, my ISP, where everything's SIP in this country already. So, you know, Orange, all the majors, they will argue with you if you want a normal analog phone line. They don't want to give it. And the, so they're, they're dealing with all this stuff. And um, the, uh, the free people, for example, give you now uh, free calls. I can call the U.S. on both my cell and my so-called landline, my SIP, uh, it's unlimited and it's free to 110 countries. And in the U.S., for many years in the U.S., you've been able, I don't know about Canada, but in the U.S., you've been able to call, most people have um, uh, the subscription fee that they pay, whatever, $20 a month, $30 a month, whatever it is, they have either unlimited or a large number of uh, minutes. You know, no one looks at area codes anymore. When I was a kid, it was like, Oh my God! Another area code. It's going to cost like twenty cents a minute. So I mean, this is over. So now, this is probably one of the other reasons why Village Telco is so interesting is that you're dealing in areas that don't have that whole in infrastructure. So in some ways, it's the Wild West because whoever comes in there uh, can control it, and you don't want some big entity to control it for huge profit margins. You want it to be. You want people to be able to use the internet and to be able to use telephony uh, to, to communicate, whether it's disaster or every day, without paying a premium. And I think that's what's so beautiful about the whole thing. Well, that's, I mean, but that's where DIDs are still the big barrier. And, yep. uh, you know, uh, not because, you know, you need them to, to communicate, you know, amongst your network, but if you want to get to them other networks, then, you know, it's a, it's a bottleneck. And, um, and you know that's something you know we would love to to pick the brains of the VUC community to you know to evolve strategies in in, in dealing with that in the because it's you know there's no I haven't seen a simple answer yet or a simple sort of scalable idea that um, uh, as a way to address it. Is there anything specific we can do to contact you uh, or you know what, they, what's to be done here? Well, they, uh, I mean, first of all, you're, uh, you're welcome to contact me. I'm steve at villagetelco.org. Um, but uh, we also we have a Google group where, you know, most of the issues uh, get discussed. And um, uh, we'd, uh, 
we'd welcome anyone from the VUC community who's interested in, in this topic. We'd love more, um, you know, uh, VoIP server uh, expertise there. And um, uh, so it's, it's a, if you, if you search for uh, uh, Village Telco in, uh -oh, in Google groups, then, um, uh, <laughs> thank you. No, you can hear me on ZipDX. Excuse me, everybody. I just got kicked, and so the audio to ZipDX kicked. Go ahead. I think I'm back, and you're no, back. I can hear you. Yeah, you can, but no one else can on the Hangout. Go ahead. But I'm on ZipDX. I know. What are they saying uh, from ZipDX? No, it was the, I got kicked on the Hangout. So Steve, and when Steve was uh, talking, oh, he was interrupted. Uh, it only was gone. There's some big progress has been made because I, I was only out for about 10 seconds. Okay. So I'm not, uh, I'm not I'm not actually in the IRC, but uh, in the left-hand side of the group chat, I posted the link to the um, to the Google group, um, which um, you know, please come and uh, come and join us. Okay, and I have uh, well, two of us. Learned a, uh, quite a lot about Batman and uh, such like <laughs> from that group. So, and basically, I think you can go to if you go to Google groups.google.com, you can probably look for Village Telco Dev, and I'm sure you can find that. Google must know how to search, although sometimes I wonder, but uh, it's probably findable. Yeah. Thanks. Oh. Okay, Steve, thank you, and um, I don't have to say don't be a stranger because we keep pestering you to come on, and I'm really glad you were able to do it this time. Uh, I'm really grateful for the support. Okay, no problem. We'll see you again soon then, and I'm going to play some music, which you won't hear on the Hangout, but you'll hear it uh, on ZipDX, and then we'll be back with the adult version in just a moment, and uh, CounterPath, we'll be talking again to Derek. Just a second.